Hi, I'm Farak Masood. I went to the Camel School of Mines. I represent Oberon Solutions Australia. At Oberon, we offer a full 360 degree sector specific answer to all your contractor management, recruitment, HR, payroll, governance and legislative issues. Let Oberon Solutions Australia take the pain away so you can focus on the projects that will move your business forward. Search Oberon Solutions Australia. Good afternoon. Today I'm going to discuss how do we see our future way of working today. And we hear the expressions all the time about being able to operate at a startup speed faster uh, and safer. But you know, if you imagine it's two environments, the, the environment of a startup and the environment of an enterprise are quite different, but really is a way to bring them together. And in doing so, adopting these new practices in a safe and controlled way inside the enterprise at the heart of it. Achieving the speed of a startup at the scale of an enterprise. So let's start with the industry. We know it's there is a lot of benefit to connecting systems, creating, you know, creating a, a fabric of data, building actionable insights to help the mining industry move towards this idea of autonomous technology in a safe way for employees. We know the benefits about $19 billion for the mining sector and about $130 billion for the metals industry. Now, the challenge here is the capital structures have existed for you know, a long and practices have existed for a very, very long time. So the human dimension to making this change is not a simple one, not an easy one. And that's really the, the, the challenge of and, and the discussion for today. Let's look into the future. We're talking about this idea of the cognitive enterprise, where AI is pervasive across the entire environment, from your infrastructure to your applications, through to the workflows, intelligence being brought in, where you know, the AI can act as a pr procedural machine, a prediction machine, and in the future, a judgment machine, able to make decisions across these uh, processes and workflows. But what it also does is starts to connect, these workflows start to connect into different industry platforms, creating different business models, but also cross industry platforms, creating a degree of automation that exists both in the front and back of the organization. Now to achieve all this, the very top of this is people and the skills that needed um, to, to adapt as you journey towards this cognitive enterprise, the ways of working and how the human experience evolves as a part of this. And that's really what today's talk's about. How do we help our employees, you know, upskill and reskill as we move towards this, this capability? So for the mining industry, being a controlled environment, it has the ability to adopt these new technologies at a faster rate than any other industry. And again, the adapting the practices towards that is really core to this. But we're seeing already examples of industry platforms across contracting, logistics, and a whole heap of other areas already. We're also seeing prediction machines and AI representing itself across these workflows and, and starting to create uh, changes in process where benefit can be realized by this in interconnected existence. And at the bottom of this stack, the systems are really getting connected. The technology platforms are allowing for insights to start to flow through, fueling AI, but also allowing our practices to adopt and adapt um, around this new capability. And again, the transformation in our way we operate and the way we work is really at the core of all of this. So let's talk about the things that fundamentally arrest our ability to change, our ability to change our work practices, ability to adopt a new way of working. And it can be broadly categorized into five key themes. The first one, no surprise, is legacy technology. At the end of the day, you're as fast as the technology will allow you to operate. So if you're encumbered with old technology, a lack of interconnected systems, um, it makes it very, very difficult, even if you do have the practices to be able to, to achieve you know, this speed of a startup. The fragmented processes, um, the, you know, the expression, we've always done it this way, um, is a key example of you know, people getting comfortable with a certain way of achieving things at work, 
and therefore uh, changing it creates a huge amount of resistance. Uh, a lot of people's you know have have developed their career around having an understanding of these processes. Talent and skills. Now, obviously, with technology requires a degree of understanding and literacy around both uh, the technology itself, but how it can be applied as well. And funding. Uh, funding cycles in a startup is very, very different than an enterprise. They're much shorter. Where people are getting money on the basis of achieving value over time, as opposed to an enterprise where yeah, you have these annual reviews, business case, and, and you eventually get to a, a degree of justification and the money submitted. It's a quite different way of achieving funding. And the challenge with that is, you know, the there is always funding gaps, um, funding, you know, uh, issues, the attribution of value and how that gets aggregated and eventually, you know, causing and impeding the team that's trying to deliver. And the last one's execution abilities. And this is bringing together all aspects of um, the, the the way in which we're able to work in this environment, this enterprise environment, to, to achieve a degree of value. So these are the, the five key ones, and they're pervasive across every industry. Um, they, they, you know, they, they, they persist. And it's a question of uh, how do you transform in a way where these impediments are removed and you're able to get to this speed to value. So let's talk about the attempts. Uh, in the industry, you could broadly categorize them into three seasons. And the attempts to transform have, have been ongoing and ever pervasive across all industries. But the first attempt uh, we've seen in season one was what we call random acts of digital. And this is characterized by, you know, a a special project, a design studio, an innovations lab, or some sort of uh, capability that was established outside the core of the enterprise. And invariably, because of these impediments, it could be just the tenure of the sponsoring executive, you could have great capability. It could be that it could be, you know, the, the initiative could be uh, smashing into the BAU bus. Technically, there may be issues or just organizationally, organizationally was not aligned um, to, to, to the ways of working. And we call these random acts of digital because they, they invariably die. Um, they fatigue and uh, don't integrate into the organization, into the enterprise. Season two was where we have management consultants come to the C-suite uh, and talk to them about the benefits of becoming a, you know, uh, of adopting a new way of working and becoming a digital organization. And the promises of 40% improvements in OPEX were you know, real, but the approach was interesting in the fact that, you know, they would say, right size your business, reduce by 10%, a reorg. We will come in and adopt and transform you by teaching and advising you of this new way of working, a journey based alignment. Agile, DevOps, and Lean, all these methodologies. But you're asking an entire organization that has a collective conscious, if you like, that has developed careers through the old way of working, through knowing what to do, to basically unlearn uh, what they know, learn something new, and be able to apply it en masse. And the challenge with that is it's almost like a test of self-worth. With a little bit of business pressure, everyone regresses back to what they know um, and you know, it becomes very, very hard to adopt any sort of new practices. Now, unfortunately, there's iterations on season two where the board is convinced that they're not trying hard enough and they'll iterate on season two once, twice, three, you know, even five times trying to get transformation to work. Now, the approach we're suggesting uh, we have been suggesting the IBM Garage, and it is best described as a fishbowl. The idea here is that we place a fishbowl in the heart of the organization. It's transparent. So the practices, the ways of working can be passively absorbed across the whole organization, able for anyone to understand how the outcomes, how the decision making is made, how it actually works, and can do it safely and passively. And the idea is you start small, you pick one initiative, and you bring it in, and through the walls of the fishbowl, this new governance we're going to talk about, create the environment that startups are used to. You know, this purpose of solving a problem 
almost like a religion mastery having a cross-functional team the best people for the job to go and execute against solving that problem and autonomy the space to succeed and fail fast into creating that value before the money runs out uh, and that's 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 how that's what we call ibm garage a transformation model let's have a look at it in a bit more detail so this is the model. I'll just go to a bigger version. And what you see here in the blue is the interface, in the green is the, the, the fishbowl, if you like. And what we're doing here is we're trying to translate the enterprise ways of working into the new way of working inside the garage. And what we do here is first establish two boards. And the first board is the investment board, and its focus is to aggregate the capital uh, from the ultimate beneficiaries of whichever initiative is operating and make sure that there's capacity funding. There's a, a, a basically 12 weeks worth of funding for every initiative inside the garage. And the mandate for this board is pretty simple. Invest in areas that there is value that has, you know, is to be captured. And on the basis that the squads are achieving the value, uh, you must follow on without causing a delay again, reducing the impediments that may occur in the old ways of working. The garage board, its responsibility is to look at a value, establish a value framework and endorse in the next most valuable initiative. And also to make access and provide access to the most talented people, the best people for the job. And that's across not just IBM doing something for you or to you. It's actually broader than that. It could be uh, the client's people, IBM's people, our competitors' people. But under this construct of, of you know, creating value before the money runs out, a key consideration is um, the cost and the speed to value that every single person can bring to the table. And the whole idea with the model is you're creating mini CEOs with these product managers or product owners that are looking to build and create a team that's going to be able to capture that value before the money runs out. The last one, which is the most interesting one, is this idea of constraints and impediments. The garage board's responsibility is to set constraints, which are standards or you know, regulatory, hard, important things that must be honored and observed by the squad. But its role is to try and unblock constraints and convert them to impediments. Test if we've always done it this way is creeping in. And if it is, convert the constraint to an impediment. And if it is an impediment, have a service level that it must unblock impediments in eight hours, 24 hours, in a very short period of time to ensure that the speed to value inside this fishbowl is not slowing down. This really makes the difference. This, through this governance and interface, we're able to turn the mirror on uh, practices and, and um, activities that were, were causing or impeding the invisible cause the invisible, unmeasurable uh, things where, which would slow uh, a team down from executing effectively. And by doing that, we're starting to reduce the administrative debt uh, and help the organization in accelerating its speed to value. And the whole idea with this model is, uh, you know, through the ceremonies of the fishbowl, you're presenting the information and uh, radiating out in terms of the value of working in this way in a daily basis, monthly basis, and quarterly basis when it's time to come back to the board and get com and confirm the value you've been creating. Now, the benefit of working this way is the squads are supported both by the garage board to getting things out of their way, but also an ac an access to a set of assets and accelerators that helps further increase their speed to value. And that's really, you know, the idea ultimately is to measure how fast they're working how much value they're creating, what is the how much debt, both administrative through impediments and technical debt is being reduced, and how are our employees engaged and capable in this new way of working. So we've developed a framework to do exactly that. We call it VOTE. And there's four measures, velocity, how fast you're working, also outcomes, how much value you're capturing in the work. You're no point doing work if the value is not being created and captured. So those two measures, the Vs and the O, represent speed to value. And then the rate of change or the rate of transformation is the T and the E. The T being technical and administrative debt, how much technical debt is being reduced, but also administrative debt, how many impediments are being reduced and the rate at which that, 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 that reduction has been occur, is occurring. And the last one and most important one to this model is employee capability and engagement. 
And if we go back to the very first slides speaking about the most important thing is ensuring that the rate of capability of the employees is increasing and the rate of change in terms of their practices and ways of working is also increasing, but most importantly, that they're engaged. And once this model is est established effectively, um, the number of minutes that the employees are in a flow state and enjoying their work in the garage is substantially greater than uh, into the enterprise. So the point where the expressions we've heard is, um, I'd rather stay working in the garage than go back to my own role. And that's really a testament to what we're trying to do. And what we are trying to do is establish this idea of value uh, and the literacy of what value is across from, you know, where the CEO announces to the market, all the way down to the initiative, down to the squad, down to the lead and lag metrics. Everybody understands the reason why the squad made the decision to pivot from where they were focusing on value to where they may go next. On the basis, there's a complete understanding um, to the value. And that in itself is a pretty important point. No longer are we doing work for output inside the garage. We're not just doing work for work's sake. We're doing work for value's sake. And that becomes a really powerful enabling aspect to the, the enterprise. Because all of a sudden, we have a collective understanding of why. And we also have a collective understanding of why not. And that really is an underlying under, uh, appreciation for the this idea that uh, you know collectively the we must change we must bring in this new technology um, and then obviously the whole idea with the model is this new way of working in the fishbowl increases by the number of initiatives until the new way of working becomes the only way of working now to help bring this all to life. Uh, we've been, I'll give you one example, which is uh, Woodside. We've been working with Woodside uh, for the last year now. And it, we began with pretty much a similar uh, a starting point as most organizations. You know, there, there was an interest about this new way of transforming, um, but there was uncertainty because of the uh, attempts of the past. So what we did is we started with a single MVP and we picked a value tree that was based on 50% of it was just talkability. Get everyone in the organization to talk about this new way of working as being valuable and beneficial to everyone. And through that, we discovered that the one area that everybody hated was onboarding new employees. So we decided to focus on onboarding new employees. And within 10 weeks, we were able to take what used to take about four weeks of, you know, of time to onboard a new employee and make them productive down to half a day or a day at most. So it was uh, both in terms of the value for everyone in the initiative itself, but also the observation of this new way of working, being able to achieve that value in such a short period of time, uh, drove an interest from other areas of the organization where we're now working with the remote operations and the operations transformation across the entire organization. So again, starting small, but at the, at the core of all this, is uh, the employees and their desire to want to change through, through intrinsic motivation. Now, the final point I want to make is the, the fact that um, Forrester have now measured this, this fishbowl, or measured this ways of working, this garage, uh, as only last month confirmed that, you know, it, it, you operate at three times speed to value. And that in itself is a pretty profound um, you know, performance rate for, for an enterprise to be able to do inside itself. But the other thing, which is probably by far the most interesting and important aspect is the employee satisfaction. As opposed to thinking about change as something being going, going to be done to me um, and the fear of missing out, it becomes through this an exciting thing, a, 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 a pervasive interest in you know what's next and how did that work and how could we benefit from it and i think in itself culture is a product of its environment and through this fishbowl we create this new environment which allows this new culture to form thank you very much